welcome to What's Not Priced In, a weekly investor podcast by Fattail Investment Research. In a world of confusion and rapid change, experts Kirill Prakopenka and Greg Canavan look behind the headlines to unveil the hidden opportunities within the Australian stock market. Now, let's dive in to today's episode. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what else? We're going to talk about NVIDIA. Of course, that's going to branch out into us talking about tech stocks and the recent rally, both in Australia and on Wall Street. And then we're going to finish with what Greg thinks the market is not pricing in. And a hint, it's about interest rates. Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of What's Not Priced In, where we'll look beyond the headlines and investigate ideas that have flown under the market's radar. Now, my name is Kirill Prakopenka, and joining me is Greg Kahneman, our editorial director. Welcome, Greg. G'day, Kirill. Looking forward to it, mate. Yeah, well, since this is the, you know, the premiere, the inaugural episode, I thought we'd quickly explain what this podcast is all about. And uh, yes, I know it's yet another investment podcast, but I hope that it's going to be unlike other podcasts. And namely, you know, we're not going to rehash the, the trending stories too much. Um, our favorite motto here is that, you know, if it's, in the pro- if it's in the news, it's in the price. So we're going to try to look beyond that and look at what the market isn't pricing in at the moment and so you know what matters is what the market has already discounted and what it hasn't yet so this show with greg's help will focus on the latter on what the markets aren't pricing in at the moment but that's enough for me it's time to give greg the floor so greg welcome and you know what do you hope to achieve with this podcast you know why 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 this podcast yeah thanks kirill um why this podcast i guess um i listen to a lot of podcast I've got a dog that needs a walk every day so I take the dog out for a walk and I put the headphone um, earphones in and listen to a range of different uh, podcasts and you know obviously they're mostly on the financial side of things um, my sort of I guess natural interest is in is in macroeconomics um, the energy transition so I, I consume a lot of that stuff and to be honest there's not a lot of Australian based content when it comes to that so um, I always thought to myself, you know, what if I ever um, did one of these things, um, I'd be interested in 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 hearing about what's not priced in. We always hear about um, what's going on in the markets and get everyone's hot take on the on the uh, the issues of the day or the week. Um, but it always sort of struck me the interesting side of things would be okay. Well, we know we know what's happening. We know what's priced in, but what's not priced in? What's What's the interesting things that are going on that where the opportunities might lie, um, where people aren't looking? So while, um, you know, and we are going to talk about the hot topics and we're going to try to drill into um, uh, beneath the headlines and, and, and try and give listeners and viewers a, a, a different take on um, the, the topics of the day. But, you know, th- there, we do have a segment called What's Not Priced In and we're going to, to look at um, different issues, different weeks uh, where we think maybe the market is missing something or in a particular stock or, or whatever it might be. But more importantly, I want to always try and bring it back to um, what it means for an Aussie investor. And I think that was one of the reasons why when we sat down and chatted, we thought this would be uh, an interesting idea just to see how it goes because there's not a lot of um, uh, Aussie-centric stuff out there when it comes to trying to match up what's happening with overseas, bigger macro issues and bringing them back to, to Australia. So, um, yeah, let's see how we go. Looking forward to it. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely the podcast scene definitely seems to skew towards the US. So hopefully this podcast rectifies that. Well, I think, yeah, without further ado, I think the biggest story of the week has definitely been NVIDIA. Um, and I'm sure by now everyone's heard the numbers. I think it uh, overnight closed 25% higher after a huge first quarter beat. And I think it gained about 200 billion in market value in one day. And I think that was one of the highest ever achieved. Um, its market cap is now nearly US 1 trillion. Uh, so what do you make of that? Well, clearly the market has been doing a lot of pricing in with Nvidia and in terms of the AI boom. Yep. Well, I mean, look, it's it's all about AI and that's certainly um, been a, a theme for the past couple of months and it's sort of reached a crescendo with this report uh, from NVIDIA um, and, you know, the, the spectacular rise in the share price. 
I guess there's, you know, th- there's two sort of takes that you hear um, in relation to to this sort of stuff. It's, you know, one saying this is a crazy bubble. Um, this is just like 2000. Uh, and then there's other people saying, look, you know, AI is a transformative um, development in the tech space and it's going to have huge implications. And obviously NVIDIA is a, is at the forefront of being able to monetize that that trend. So, you know, I've I looked at some of the numbers, uh, and if you look at it purely from a you know an old-fashioned valuation perspective, you look at the numbers and you say, okay, um, Nvidia's got a uh, financial year end of January, so um, for the year to January, uh, it's trading on a PE of sixty times, it's trading on twenty-two times sales, and it's got a price to book of twenty-five times. So you know, you, you your average value investor would say that's insane. Um, you know, not going anywhere near it. Um, and I, I would be, as, as a value investor, I sort of, you know, have sympathy with that view. But often those metrics don't necessarily tell you the full story. And I think, you know, we could talk a lot about about this um, in, in relation to big tech. And one of the, the th- and, and NVIDIA's numbers, which I'll, I'll get, get to in a sec, they're emblematic of the whole tech set, not the whole tech sector, but the, those mega um, cap tech stocks, you know, your um, Googles and Amazons and, and Apple. Um, so if you look at NVIDIA's numbers, their return on equity using their free cash flow. So their free cash flows are huge. They're generating 63% return on equity. That's the forecast for um, FY24, 63% return on equity. Um, and they're reinvesting over 90% of their profits back into the business. So if you think about the way that that compounds in terms of the, the, the compound wealth um, of that, if you, if you project that forward, um, NVIDIA probably deserves its valuation. So the question is, do you think that compounding can continue? And if I look at um, the, the EPS forecast for FY24, EPS forecast to rise or increase, and this is on consensus, uh, analyst estimates. So the the EPS forecast. I just got the updated numbers. There's probably some flow through from uh, from recent upgrades. 265% EPS increase uh, from FY23 to FY24. Admittedly, uh, FY23 was a big decline on FY22. So they went from around nine bill um, nine billion of uh, of, of um, net profit in FY24 down to around, I think it was four bill um, in FY23. So they're bouncing back up um, massively, I think to around 15 bill for FY24. Growth um, from there is 14.7% and then 23%. Uh, so you're seeing you know, um, huge growth. They've got no debt. They've got a net cash position of around about 14 billion and they're still generating these massive returns on their, on their shareholders' equity. So um, for me, the question is, and, you know what what's what's priced in at these levels i mean ai is everywhere um everyone's talking about it um and one of the um i'll just share my screen for a minute because we, we um i know that you dug around and and looked at um some magazine covers and this is one of the things that we're going to do in this show as well is have a look at the magazine uh cover indicator and the premise behind this is that when uh, a topic or a stock or a person or whatever it might be is is in the headlines or is on the cover of some pretty big uh, global magazines in the in the business world. You can pretty much bet that you know a lot of that good news is in the price. So I know you did did a little bit of digging uh, and you found that AI is on the cover of the Economist. Um, the uh, I think that guy on the front there, Sam Altman, he's the Chat GPT guy. So that's uh, that's the I guess that's the the thing that really got the AI um, concept into the into the popular imagination when Chat GPT come out and people actually went oh okay that's what this stuff's about um, you know that's what really captured the, the the broader market's attention in this topic and then um, the Financial Times Weekend magazine is talking about it as well um, so you've got you know it's 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 everywhere at the moment it's in um, it's in everyone's uh, mindset, um, and I just think you know you look at these prices, and and even though you can make a justification that the compounding effect of these businesses um, is is 
is justified. Uh, you know, to me, and, and this is what I guess we want to try to, to do in this podcast, we want to find the opportunities that people aren't looking at. Um, and while everyone's looking over there, we want to look the other way and see, you know, what, what the um, opportunities are. So, you know. Well, yeah, just to be a devil's, um, devil's advocate here a little bit, because I think you were saying, you know, um, the, the forward estimates definitely project a lot of growth. I think that's the, the key issue there if you want it to be a little bit of a, of a, of a skeptic. And I think I have a, you know, a quote here from Buffett. He said that, you know, the age of projecting out extremely high growth rates for very, very long periods of time has caused investors to lose very, very large sums of money. And I think at the moment, um, everyone is sort of thinking AI has this huge TAM, the revenues are going to be enormous. And so they're on a forward PE basis, the valuations might look pretty good, but what if those growth rates turn out to be quite unrealistic? Yeah, absolutely. And when you've got, um, you know, massive compounding numbers factored into your models, if there's any, if there's a slight tweak to those, um, that can that can result in in, in big changes. So, um, you know, I'm certainly, uh, I guess, two things: sympathetic to the view that this is a huge future trend. Um, but like anything, when there's huge future trends, there's generally too much money chasing that trend. And if you think about Nvidia um, or, or Microsoft or, or Google for that matter, they're just effectively um, eating the lunch of other competitors at the moment. It's not as if it's not as if that market is growing so fast that Nvidia and, and a whole bunch of others can can grow at a um, at, at a very fast pace. So um, you know, it's certainly something to keep your eye on. But you know, in terms of uh, in terms of looking for opportunities, that that's an opportunity that 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 has been and gone. And I might just quickly show um, some charts of the uh, the big big tech players because it's sort of it's interesting if you look at so Nvidia, for example, um, as you mentioned earlier, twenty five percent spike that's gone to new all time highs. Um, which is bullish, like there's no doubt that new all time highs you can't sort of you know couch that in any any other term apart from it's a it's a bullish move uh, but Microsoft rallying back towards its old um all time highs from uh twenty twenty one this was the peak in the nasdaq by the way, and this is the bear market that tech and and most stocks went through last year but now you're seeing and this often happens um in in all bubbles that pop you get a a reactive bubble that goes up towards the old time old uh, all-time highs. Uh, it's something similar is happening to Apple here. It's bounced, it's rallied back up towards um, all-time highs. Uh, Google, not quite as far, but it's it's heading up that way. Uh, uh, if we look at Meta, which is the old Facebook again, not quite up to all-time highs, but it's getting getting towards that. And then if we look at the, um, the I think the um, New York FANG index is about the 10, I think it's the 10 biggest tech stocks. That's coming up to all time highs as well. So there's a there's an argument to say that this is a this is a bit of an echo bubble from the from the 2021 bubble, and you're seeing a rally back to these highs, and everyone's sort of saying, look, it's back on, uh, but the backdrop is completely different. You know, we don't have zero um, percent interest rates. You've got a Fed that is at um, over five percent. And you know, probably going to be on hold for a while. And I know we're going to talk about interest rates in a little bit, so um, might leave that for then. But you know, we're, we're at a different environment. But yet, the the investor enthusiasm is back uh, in the in the tech stocks. Yeah, and do you think that this momentum can be sustained? You know, everyone, you know, Chad GTP, I think, was one of the, if not the most um, adopt the most fastest adopted technology. I think it took only a few months for to get a million um, subscribers. So. Um, Everyone sort of knows ChatGDP. A lot of people have used it, so they've felt the impact of AI and its potential. So, uh, would a lot of investors maybe feel a bit of FOMO and sort of keep this momentum going for months, or even six months, or maybe twelve months? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it just, I guess, it depends on um, it depends on how um, you know how much that that feeling hangs around. You've got. Um, Chat GBT is just the first um, incarnation of it. You know, you're going to get competitive, other competitive offerings. Um, whether AI has the same sort of first mover slash network advantage that a lot of tech stuff does, I don't know. Um, 
but you can bet that there's a lot of people out there working on on different versions of that stuff so um perhaps it's not like it's going to be popular but perhaps it can't be dominated in the way that um i don't know cloud computing can be or you know the network effect of say a facebook or or the the dominant online advertising revenues of a google um whether you know ai is 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 going to be more fragmented or not that that remains to be seen and i'm not a tech specialist so i don't i don't know um you know what the what the course would be it was interesting though i looked at um a couple of the the aussie tech stocks yesterday all sort of moving up in uh um uh using the momentum of that ai trade and and i guess one of the um main ones is uh next dc but you and that's a data center operator in australia and obviously data centers are going to be a huge beneficiary of you know all this additional computing power and stuff like that um but unlike nvidia which has got massive free cash flows and um you know very strong balance sheet and, and hugely dominant next dc uh doesn't really have much in the way of earnings it's got uh, a reasonable amount of debt um and it's obviously building out its infrastructure but you have to say to yourself well okay it's it's an infrastructure stock yes it's an infrastructure of the future but in what in what way is that a different from a regular utility um so i think there's there's areas where you know investors need to be a little bit wary and say okay well yes there's growth here because they're going to be building out infrastructure to 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 you know process all this data and stuff like that but you know these are capital intensive businesses that require a lot of money to set up a data center requires a lot of energy to run the data centers um and what's the return on those assets and return on investments going to be um so you know i would just be cautious against chasing into into the sort of local local trends of ai um especially in that case of of next dc where you know earnings are still a long way off in terms of um you know returns to shareholders and dividends in the pocket stuff like that yeah and i think with with ai it's going to be an interesting sort of stage of price discovery i think it's definitely uh fast developing technology but there's a finite way of making money um and so the business model has to be quite um specific like you know who's actually going to monetize their technology and it, to what extent and i think we we had an editorial day i think last week and one of our editors ryan dins was saying that one of the ways that uh ai companies will probably make money is the ones that um possess the data that sort of feeds into all of those ai algorithms so um the the ones that sort of can control the pipeline of the data can be a good bet or like a picks and shovel sort of business like nvidia that sort of supplies the infrastructure for for those those big companies um so yeah what do you think about that you know how do you think ai companies um can monetize that yeah it's a good question and you know what i i don't really know the answer to it i mean the the easy answer as ryan pointed out is that you know if you own the data um that is a huge benefit in in this environment in this market um but like anything you know it's really early days um from an investor's perspective to me i just sort of look at what the returns are um the potential returns in the competitive environment and i think the biggest question mark is what is the competitive environment going to be how many um how many different types of ai are going to come out and compete with each other um are the big tech companies going to just go and buy any new um ai stuff that comes out and put it into their um ecosystem so uh yeah very early days with this um but i would i guess finish up by saying a lot of that good news is priced in yeah yeah and i think sort of in the nvidia story sort of branches out into the into the wider sort of tech boom that we've sort of seen recently in tech stocks both in in the us and even in on the asx so i think earlier this week why is that global hit a record high and it's now a market cap of about 25 billion um and the stock is up nearly 50% year to date zero is up over 55% year to date we've mentioned next dc it's up about 35% year to date noix is is up is up about 45% and i think the information technology index over here in the in, in australia is up about 25% year to date whereas the the benchmark asx 200 is up only about what 3 or 5% so there's a there's a clear boom and there's a clear discrepancy between the wider market and the in the tech market so what do you make of that at the moment yeah i mean you know it's it's a polar opposite to 
2022, right? And I wrote about this in uh, um, my uh, newsletter for subscribers back in the March issue. And I, I, I think I put a headline in something like, um, you know, is this the bottom for tech? And uh, I wrote about zero and, and said to keep an eye on zero. And if it broke out, I think it was above $90 and it could be a good speculative um, play. I didn't put in the portfolio because there's a value um, as a value investor, it's a really tricky stock to 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 um, to invest in. Other than you know, I, I I get the whole you know it's a very good technology, and for people who don't know, Zero is a, effectively a cloud based accounting software package. Uh, New Zealand based, got really dominant position in New Zealand, Australia, UK, branching out into um, the US, where the competitive threats are a little bit different, but it's got a huge potential market out there. Um, and it, it, you know, it got new management last year, which said that we're going to run it a, a, a little bit differently, more cost of, effectively. So there, there's there's huge um, huge upside with it. But my concern was that we are going into a global recession, and it does service a lot of small businesses. And in a global recession, small businesses struggle. So, you know, initially I was thinking, you know, it, from a charting perspective. And from a macro perspective, where you had global bond yields starting to decline, and really that was the reason why tech was was rising in the first place. It was just responding to the peak in inflation in the US, uh, bond yields coming down. And as I mentioned, that reflexivity of, oh, bond yields are coming down, therefore I should buy tech, is what everyone did, regardless of the underlying fundamentals of the, the earnings story or anything like that. So I think there is a little bit of that going on in the Aussie Aussie tech space. I'm not sure if the the earnings outlook really justifies a lot of these rallies, but you know it's because everyone invests in tech when when yields are falling. So I better invest in tech because yields are falling. Funnily enough, uh, nominal bond yields have started to pick back up in the last couple of weeks, and and the tech stocks have decided not to worry about that. So um, yeah, question marks over the um, whether the whether this rally is the the real deal or whether it's just a as I said an echo rally from the big sell-off in, in 2022, and this is the sort of, okay, got pretty bad, sold off heavily, people are playing the bounce thinking, oh, okay, it's back on. Um, but yeah, I would question whether whether that's the case. Yeah, and I think especially in the in the US, that's a bit more pronounced with the, me the mega cap tech stocks like Meta surging quite a lot in the last six months. And I think um, you've sort of had a discussion with this with, an, with another editor of ours, Vern Gowdy, who was sort of, pointing out that um, the valuations of the mega cap stocks over in the US look a little bit um, toppy, look a bit frothy, but you were sort of making the case that that, you know, isn't necessarily overvaluation if you consider the continued growth rates and return on equity of those big businesses. So maybe, can you maybe tell the viewers that, um, you know, why sometimes a high PE stock isn't necessarily overvalued? Yeah, it comes back to that point I made earlier about the, the compounding effect of reinvested earnings. So um, the really simple way to think about it is if, if a company pays out, let's say 60 to 80% of its earnings in the form of a dividend, then implicitly or explicitly, I should say, it's not reinvesting much of its capital back into growth. It's, it's actually taking its earnings and saying, you as shareholders, you can take those earnings. We only need a little bit of it to grow. So those companies don't or shouldn't have much of a growth multiple because they aren't reinvesting back in to grow. Whereas if you're a company that is generating significant amount, amount of cash and you're and, and with these tech companies, because they're not capital intensive and they're global and they're massively scalable, you're making really big margins and you're not needing to reinvest a lot of money um, back into that business in terms of uh maintenance capital so there's not a huge amount of in reinvestment you need to do in order to just stand still so any amount of money you reinvest it's for um, developing new um, new technology or buying back shares or, or whatever it might be but if you're reinvesting 90 percent of your earnings and you're generating return on those earnings of 30 40 50 percent as i said even over a short space of time that's that's a, a significant compounding effect and companies that do that will have a much higher P ratio and you can't compare that company's P ratio to say 
I don't know, uh, the P ratio of a bank that pays out a lot of its earnings as a dividend. So, um, yeah, it's just, and, and, and this is where we are talking about before, you're getting this conversation where people say, oh, NVIDIA's got a P of 60 times and 22 times sales. It's crazy overvalued. There's no way it's worth that much. Um, it's worth that much if it continues to do what it's doing and those forecasts uh, come out to be okay. But my contention is that those forecasts are probably too optimistic because everyone loves NVIDIA and everyone wants to, you know, buy NVIDIA and the analysts who are covering it think that it's going to raise earnings by this, this and this year after year. Probably not going to happen. Um, and no doubt the whole way um, capitalism works or should work is that, you know, if you if there are big returns to be had and big margins to had, it should attract competitors into the space to try and compete some of those big returns away. So um, that's where going back to your excellent Warren Buffett quote, if you're buying into companies that have got lots of positive growth priced into them, um, it's a good way to potentially lose a fair bit of money. Yeah, and I think I was reading um, a book by Bruce Greenwald. I don't know if you've, you've heard of him. And he had yep. this book called Com Competition Demystified. And he said um, he's basically a big advocate that in terms of competitive advantage, the, the biggest thing there to consider is barriers to entry. So he's basically a huge, huge fan of just focusing on the industry's barriers to entry. And with AI, I wonder if the barriers to entry will sort of diminish because if you go on Twitter or LinkedIn, there's always some guy going, oh, look, this is some kind of model that I've created. This is, oh, look, this is an app that I've created or look, I've downloaded this free software, open source, large language model, and look what I've been able to do. So um, AI might be a revolutionary technology, but usually if with those type of technologies, they sort of bring the benefits to the consumer rather than the businesses and they drive costs lower. Um, so I'm just wondering what the next 10 years will look like. And definitely AI will be huge, but will that mean Will it be huge for businesses? And I'm just not sure at this moment. And I'll probably just all aggregate to the to the monopolies anyway, like the Googles and the and the Microsofts and probably Nvidia. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Um, if anything, from a macro perspective, it's going to be hugely deflationary, right? Because it's going to um, it'll be you know used in a way that creates efficiencies. Um, there's probably a lot of jobs that AI could do quite easily. And I I remember, I can't remember if it was at our um, day last week, but reminded me of this book um, that a guy called David Graeber wrote um, years ago called Bullshit Jobs. And it was just about the amount of jobs that people do or the, the number of jobs that are there that people do that they're probably, you know, they're just bullshit jobs. They don't really add too much value. Whereas the way that AI is going to come in and, and take those jobs and do those jobs, um, and, and, you know, robotics, all that sort of stuff is going to free up um, resources and reduce costs for companies. So this is quite possibly be a, a big deflationary event, which is, uh, you know, probably going to be a welcome thing given that um, the way governments are spending money around the world, which is inflationary at the moment. So um, that's the sort of macro aspect I'm, I would look at it. But, you know, if this continues to be uh, something that is in the news and and people want to know more about, we might get uh, get Dinsey in one time for a bit of a chat about it because he's far more knowledgeable on the on the topic than what I am. I sort of just look at it purely from a you know um, companies and, and valuations and you know uh, are there investment opportunities and in my um, limited uh, brain when it comes to this stuff, I would say the opportunity um, is somewhere completely different. Yeah. Yeah, so you would say it's fully priced in the opportunity right now in, in AI. Fully priced in, yeah, 100%. <laughs> That's the takeaway of today. Yes. Well, I think um, I would want to maybe move on now to to a sector that isn't booming as much as the tech, tech sector, and that's the retail stocks. Uh, and they're having a pretty bad time of it lately, especially in recent weeks. Um, just this week we had Universal Store, and I think that's a youth retailer and it fell nearly 30% on Wednesday. And, you know, it sort of, it did come out and say, you know, we're, we're forecasting record uh, uh, financial year 23 sales, but it admitted that trading was pretty soft in April and May. And it thinks that those tighter conditions are gonna roll into the next year, financial year. And then on Monday we had CT Chic, 
and it sort of continues to sort of struggle with inventory. It continues to sort of um, try to clear excess stock by driving promotional activity, and that's definitely hurting its margins. And year-to-date sales are down 15%. Um, and it sort of said that margins are going to remain soft well into full year 24. Um, and of course, we've had the recent struggles with beauty retailer BWX, and it sort of entered voluntary administration. Uh, I think fragrance retailer Dusk is down 40% year to date and hit a 52 week low this week. Um, and also had a pretty disappointing trading update last Friday. Um, and I think it had a quote there from a management that sort of said that it's been impacted by an increasingly cautious consumer environment driven by high interest rates and mounting cost of living pressures impacting the disposable income levels of our core customer. Um, an outlier, of course, is Satire. I find that a very interesting to- uh, stock. It's hard for me to sort of value it. It's up 50% year to date and came out with some strong sales data, but it, it has also fallen off in recent days as well, along with Levisa. Um, so, yeah, a lot of. So, what, yeah, what do you make of retail stocks? Well, you know what? Like, is it such a surprise that retail stocks are under the pump? I mean, you know, you've had the sharpest rate rise um, cycle in, I'm pretty sure, history. We've gone from, and, and this is in a year, you know, we've gone from uh, the, the RBA's cash rate of 0.1% last May to 3.85% now. I mean, it's a huge rate, uh, huge rise. The thing is, and I sort of talk about this a lot um, to my subscribers, is that monetary policy operates with a lag. So it does take time for monetary policy to flow through and have an effect on uh, on the economy. And the other um, issue was that post-COVID, uh, consumers had quite a lot of savings to draw on and they've been drawing down on those savings for the past few months. And I think now it's getting to a point where interest rates have gone up a lot and you know as someone with two kids family a mortgage uh inflation has been a massive tax um you know the food bill has gone up hugely anything that you buy has gone up your mortgage has gone up there's not a lot left over so you know i'm not hitting the shops and 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 buying um much in the way of of retail um and i would imagine you know, even people without a mortgage uh, are sort of, you know, tightening their belts in a similar fashion. So yeah, it's well, not I think surprising. The, um, the Universal Store CEO, she sort of said that her core demographic are young people and most of them don't have a mortgage, but they do have hex debt and they are mostly renters. And obviously rent has gone sky high in recent recent times. And I think um, with hex debt, it's been indexed to like 7% inflation. So they're paying more in student loans and also pay more in rent. So even if those people that don't have a mortgage, they've been squeezed by higher inflation anyway. So almost any, everyone's been impacted. Um, and I think me personally, I just bought a tennis racket, but it was so expensive that I'm probably not going to be making any discretionary purchases for the next like five to six months. Hey, mate, my daughter plays tennis and, um, you know, it's an expensive, expensive sport, but she's been playing since she's four. So it's not really something we can just, pull her out of and say, you know, bad luck, you're not playing anymore. So, you know, belt gets tightened elsewhere. It's it's just it's just one of those things. And the point is that tax is a, uh, sorry, inflation is a massive tax and it doesn't really, yes, it's a middle class tax because it really affects the middle class. But as you just pointed out, the youngsters who who don't have um, housing and don't have a mortgage are still getting, still getting hit. Um, and I'm just going to show, I'll quickly share my screen and show a, a, a chart of the, what is it, the Consumer Discretionary Index, which is a um, which is a chart of, you know, obviously consumer discretionary stocks. It bottomed back here in June of 2022, and it's sort of been making its way slowly higher, um, which is defying a lot of the expectations about consumers being under pressure and stuff like that. And it was sort of looking, you know, I look at these, um, lines here which is the 150 day moving averages as a you know an illustration of a trend and you would say that you know the and the fact that we got a low here a higher low and another higher low higher low all sort of suggest that this index was trending higher but just in the last few days as you point out 
there's been some heavy selling that's come through. And it was always sort of my contention that, you know, it was only a matter of time before this was going to roll over because consumer spending is such an important part of the economy. I've got my eye on a lot of consumer stocks, to be honest. Um, if you look at, say, Harvey Norman, which is obviously one of the biggest consumer discretionary stocks out there, its share price is at lows from, I think, going back to t- nearly 2020. Um, so that's under a lot of under a lot of pressure. And even, um, say, a company like Qantas, which I've just got there as well, that's been a massive beneficiary of the reopening trade. Uh, share price has done really, really well um, over the past year or so. But this sort of pattern here where you see a bit of volatility but not really moving up to new highs is sometimes a sign of what's called distribution, which means the um, buyers of the stock that were buying at these lower levels are now distributing it to uh, buyers that are sort of coming to the party a little bit late uh, and doing so in a slow manner. Um, so you get these, you often get these distrib- distribution patterns at, at important tops. Whether that is the case here or not remains to be seen. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see the share price breaking down in the next couple of months after this sort of period of, of distribution, purely because. Um, uh, you know, yes, there's been a big reopening trade. Yes, there's been pent up demand for travel, but by the same token, as why people aren't going into retail shops. You know, there's got to be a a limit as to how much um, European holidays that people want to have, or even you know, flying domestically. Um, you know, we've got family in Adelaide, so we take it generally take an annual trip to Adelaide for the kids to see their their grandparents, and you know, the flights there. We um, ended up driving last year because the flights were just so expensive. So we did the uh, the cross cross country trip, which is sort of fun. But um, yeah, I mean, it is is very expensive. And and at some point, if the interest rate um, regime stays high, and I think it will, um, you know, people are going to pull their pull their belts in and and, and discretionary travel, discretionary retail. Uh, they're all going to all going to suffer. I think that means there's going to be good opportunities in that sector. I think if we do see continued sell-offs there i think you know you're already seeing a a good bit of value emerge in that sector um but history suggests you probably don't buy them in a rising rate environment you sort of look to see when the the curve um changes in terms of interest rates and the cutting cycle starts that's when you probably start getting interested in them again yeah i think maybe an interesting outlier with this is um i just quickly looked at some some luxury retail stocks um, especially the european uh, luxury stocks like Louis Vuitton, uh, Christian Dior, and oh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Hermes. Uh, I think Louis Vuitton is up. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not their key customer. Um, I think Louis Vuitton is up 20% year to date and about maybe 50% over the past 12 months. I think Christian Dior is up 15% year to date and about 45% over the past 12 months. And I think Hermes is up about 80% over the past 12 months, but um, all three sort of fell sharply on Wednesday, but they're still up pretty pretty strong over the past few few months. So what do you make of that? I guess, you know, if you're an extremely rich person and you can afford these luxury brands, it doesn't really matter if interest rates are going up or inflation, you're, you're set either way. Yeah, the, the, one, the 1% are doing fine, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and look, I, mean, I think I don't follow those stocks, but, you know, I'd imagine the... Um, the, the China reopening trade has got a lot to do with that. I did read anecdotal reports of when China reopened, you know, plain loads of wealthy Chinese flew to Paris and started buying up lots of stuff. So, you know, whether that's the reason behind those strong numbers or whether they're just, you know, um, continuing to grow in terms of outlets um, in China especially. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the 1% don't really care about um, rising interest rates and inflation. Well, I Not think like now, us <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think now is maybe a good time to sort of, you know, we talked about what's been priced in and now clearly the podcast is about what's not priced in. So I thought we'd move on um, and talk about that. Um, and I think you've wanted to maybe talk about interest rates and uh, especially what you think the market is maybe underpricing the fact that interest rates are likely going to stay higher for longer. Yeah, I think, you know, this is, um, really interesting from a, this is sort of like a macro uh, as well as a stock um, sort of, or a stock market uh, topic. And it comes back to what we we're talking about earlier with tech. And I think 
the market um, is looking through this recession and saying, okay, we're slowing down. Probably the US is probably going to go into recession if it's not already in recession. Um, and therefore, the Fed will start cutting interest rates and, uh, and you know, back to the, off to the races because interest rates are, are going down. That means stocks should go up. Um, and there's two things that I don't think are priced in there. Um, one of them is that I think the Fed stays on hold for much longer than the market expects. Um, I don't have the latest data on, on what the market's pricing in, but I think the market's looking at interest rate cuts starting in around September um, of this year. So unless there is um, definite evidence of a weaker labor market that would suggest the Fed needs to start cutting, um, then the Fed's going to be on hold for the rest of this year. And I don't think the market has priced that in. So I think there's market's got well ahead of itself. And especially on the tech side, we explained, we said earlier that falling bond yields, which um, are another uh, expression of um, the market thinking interest rates are going to be cut, that's bullish for tech. Um, so the tech's already priced a lot of these interest rate cuts in, and I don't think that's going to happen. So putting, putting it simply, the Fed remaining on hold for 2023 isn't priced in. The other thing that I don't think is priced in is the market thinking about what falling interest rates actually mean. So in the post-2008 environment with a really low interest rate, um, that, what, that related to uh, an excess of supply over demand, right? So there was plenty of supply. It kept inflation low. It kept interest rates low. And the market just went low interest rates, sweet higher share prices, um, I love lower interest rates. And they're mistaking what's coming down the track. Let's say it's 2024 when the Fed starts cutting interest rates because of recession and slowdown, all that sort of stuff and uh, inflation getting under control. The market isn't realizing that's because of weaker demand. So pr previously in the, in, the, in the past cycle, you had uh, supply, um, excess supply keeping interest rates lower and inflation, I should say. This time, I think it's going to be um, a lack of demand that's going to push inflation and interest rates down. Now, that's a very, very different um, dynamic and it's very different in terms of what it's going to do for revenues and earnings um, and the multiple that the market puts on those earnings. So what's not priced in is a demand-led recession slash um, decline in interest rates and inflation. Um, so I think if you if you combine those two things together, uh, you know, I think there's certain parts of the market that are um, still very overvalued. And I would suggest tech's probably in that space. Um, but that that comes back the I always look at the market as a market of stocks, not a stock market, because it is so and especially in the US, it is so concentrated at the moment around those big stocks that if you look under the surface, I'm sure there are plenty of individual opportunities there. So um, it's one thing to say, oh, the market is overvalued. Um, I'm still finding lots of stocks for my subscribers that I think are a good long-term value. Um, plenty of Aussie stocks are on yields of 6 7% plus, if you throw in a franking credit. Um, you're up to you know 8 or 9% pre-tax yields. Um, yes, there's question marks over those future earnings, um, but if you buy, if you do your numbers and you and you do your valuations and you can buy it, um, you know, a really good uh, margin of safety, then I think there's still plenty of opportunities out there. But more broadly, I would say that's not priced in um, a Fed or an RBA staying on hold for for longer than what the market currently expects, and the fact that um, downturns are led by demand slowdowns, not excess supply. Well, why, why do you think the market is sort of not pricing in, pricing that in fully? What's, what's their logic for that? Don't know. Don't know. Wishful thinking. Um, may, 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 maybe, maybe a lot of the, like th this is the interesting thing about markets. So a lot of the people that are driving the investment decisions probably haven't been around for too many cycles. So they, they might not even, Think about this stuff. I mean, the, the rise of the ETF and the passive investment theme, um, do you think someone who wants exposure to tech stocks and are just buying the NASDAQ 100 thinks about this stuff? They just see 
the market going up and say, I want a piece of that. So I'll, I'll, I'll buy an ET, I'll buy a tech ETF. Thanks. And then, um, I don't know, maybe 30 or $40 out of every hundred goes into the four top four or five tech stocks. So you just get this huge concentration of capital going in and there's not a lot of people thinking about it, to be honest. Um, so, you know, in answer to your question, I don't really know. Um, but these sorts of things happen in, in markets all the time. One, one area that has, that is pricing in, um, not necessarily a recession, but certainly pricing in a slowdown. If you look at the commodities markets, um, let's have a quick look at copper and gold, for example. Um, we'll just go back. Yes, exactly. So here's, here's the copper um, chart. Um, so it peaked back in January of this year and it's just sort of, you know, it's really fallen off a cliff. And as you can see by these moving averages, it started to turn down. It's actually going back down to its lows from, um, what is it, July 2022. So um, I know James Cooper, our commodities guy, he's saying, look, this is a gift uh, for, for longer term because the, um, the longer term supply situation for copper is so um, constrained and obviously demand that's needed uh, for this whole um, energy transition is going to underpin um, demand for years and years and years. Uh, you know, that's another topic in itself. We can maybe talk about that in the, in the weeks ahead. But right now, copper is falling quite sharply. And if you ask me why, you know, there's a number of reasons, but I would say that in financial markets, um, commodity prices don't always reflect physical supply and demand. If, if a hedge fund thinks, okay, I need to hedge against a, a slowdown, what do I do? I might, um, I might sell oil short, I might sell copper short. So these are paper trades that are pushing, because this is the copper futures price, these are um, paper trades that are pushing prices down to these, these lower levels. So if you're a, a longer term investor who wants to you know, physically buy the companies that are producing this stuff, to me, this is a great opportunity to do so. Um, and if I look at, so this is the, uh, this is the gold index, um, it's corrected um, reasonably decently in the last sort of couple of weeks. But if you look at it from a longer term perspective, you know, it's, it's hit these highs that it's really struggled to get through um, for a while. But we've had a massive rally from the September 22 glow correction, big rally up here. I, around this time, I said to my subscribers, look, let's move all our gold stocks back to a hold. Um, you know, there's a good chance that we're going to get a correction around this level. And we've seen it happen here. I'm starting to get to a point where I think you know those gold stocks can go back to a buy because we've corrected quite well. The uptrend is still in effect, um, and 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 I think this is just a reflection of gold, oil, copper. All the commodities are starting to say, okay, there's going to be a global slowdown, um, and how do I hedge against a global slowdown? I I, I sell those you know um, economically sensitive metals or, or materials or, or whatever, whatever it might be. And in the case of gold, um, I always like to point out gold is, um, very sensitive to real interest rates and real interest rates in the U S have may have kept quite high. They haven't actually fallen too much this year. I think, um, the last numbers I looked at, uh, just this morning, the real interest rate was up around the highest it's been all year. So that's going to put pressure on gold as well. Uh, and until you see interest rates start to come down, until you see nominal yields start to fall, um, you know, gold could be under under pressure for a little bit longer. But I still think after a decent correction, you should be accumulating uh, in that in that uh, in that space. So, um, yeah, I would say commodities are quite interesting because they're starting to price in a slowdown, um, whereas lots of other um, sectors and and areas are not really pricing that in at all. Well, what's interesting, as a, maybe a quick aside, is that you know gold is sort of thought of as a as a safe haven haven asset, but um, it's uh, it's definitely not uh, in terms of the whole uh, dead ceiling fiasco. Gold hasn't really um, spiked up in in recent weeks, so I'm guessing uh, the global markets aren't really pricing in a, a catastrophe, and they think the the deal is going to get done. So, do you have any thoughts on the on that whole shenanigans over? In, in yeah, America? I mean. Initially, when gold was rising, when that the debt ceiling issue first came out, gold was gold was rising, and I, I wrote a I wrote an article saying, look, just be a little bit careful here because gold's rising, even though real yields are rising as well, and and in generally that should 
be a headwind for gold. But clearly the market was saying, okay, this debt ceiling is an issue. Um, we can't keep putting our money into short-term US treasuries and paper, so maybe we park a little bit in gold. I, I don't know, maybe that was the the, the, the rationale for that. Um, but as you say, that's that hasn't been happening the last couple of weeks. Gold's been selling off. So w- what that means for the debt ceiling, I don't know. Perhaps it's the market starting to say, look, you know, we think there'll be a resolution um, and, and they're sort of taking the money off the table in terms of those safe haven bets. Um, and, you know, then gold starting to price itself in, in, in relation to real yields, which are still quite restricted. Yeah. Well, I think uh, as a maybe as a final concluding thought, what do you think is maybe the, the, the biggest thing that the market isn't pricing in at the moment? And that, would that for you be interest rates? Yeah, I'd go back to um, – I'll just go back to the, the bigger picture stuff. Um, you know, pretty much all year the market has been waiting for the Fed's pivot and the Fed keeps saying there's not going to be a pivot. We're going to actually raise rates more than you think. And then when Silicon Valley Bank went under, the market said, okay, there's going to be a pivot now. And the Fed said, we're not pivoting. We're going to raise rates again. So there has been uh, comments from uh, Jay Powell that, you know, they've probably done enough – there is evidence that those banking issues are restricting credit. Again, the lagged effects of that are going to take a while to play out. Um, so my guess is that Fed's on hold from now on, but they probably will be on hold for longer than what the market expects. And if they do start cutting interest rates, that's not going to be a good thing. That's because the that they're concerned that the economy has slowed down much more than they thought. Uh, Inflation is no longer a problem. And if you go back to past cycles, um, especially I think the closest analogue to the one we're in now is probably the 2000 cycle. Um, the S&P 500 fell 50% in that cycle and the Fed cut interest rates. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of the exact number, but they cut rates from somewhere around maybe the 6% level all the way down to 1.75% throughout 2000, I think into a 2002 low. And all that time, the Fed was cutting rates, the S&P 500 was falling. So, And that's because demand slows down. Demand uh, impacts revenues, impacts earnings, and then the stock market re- reacts to that. So, um, yeah, that would be my what's not priced in. Um, but who knows? We might come up with a different one next week. Yeah, and I think your biggest takeaway is that the, the AI trade is fully priced in at the moment, would you say? Uh, judging from the magazine uh, index indicator, mate, yes, fully priced in. Although Dinsey will probably have a different opinion on that. So as I said, if the uh, if the magazines keep putting it on the front covers, we might have to get him in. Well, I think my, my tentative bet is that we'll be hearing about AI for, for a long time to come. Yeah, but, you're probably um, right. Uh, well, thank you for, for joining me in this first episode. I had a great time and um, we'll be doing this every Friday. So if you guys enjoyed it, stay tuned for, for my episodes. Thanks for joining What's Not Priced In, your weekly source of unique ideas in the Australian stock market. If you enjoyed this episode, please show your support by liking and subscribing and turn those post notifications on so you don't miss a thing. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes as we delve into new topics, trends and stocks. Thanks for your support. Hope to see you next week.